visitors will start entering. Hmm. There we go. I'm giving my slides away. Don't mean to be. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the Palmer Museum of Arts webinar, our Museum Conversations program, Words and Paint, that is a preview of an upcoming special exhibition on uh, uh, field language, the painting and poetry of Warren and Jane Rohrer. Uh, the exhibition will be opening on February 10th, along with the reopening of the museum. It's very exciting. We're all very pleased about it and to be coming back to this uh, exhibition of beautiful paintings is very exciting. So today we have our curatorial team from this exhibition, the people who were instrumental in putting it all together. And um, we're gonna very quickly transition to them, but I just wanted to, you know, provide the welcome. Thank you for being with us today, especially if you're here in um, State College, it might be a nice way to spend a snowy afternoon. Um, I do want to mention that we invite you to use the Q&A feature on your Zoom menu, as well as you're welcome to use the chat as well. I will be monitoring it as will um, Joyce, one of our presenters today. And if appropriate, we'll kind of interject your question as needed throughout the program, or, you know, ideally we'll hold questions till the end. But if there's something you would like to um, ask in the moment, we'll see if we have an opportunity to inject that. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the uh, microphone to Joyce, our assistant director at the Palmer, as well as our curator of contemporary art and um, the person at the Palmer who is really um, the museum representative for, you know, making this happen and getting it installed and all work uh, with our guest curators. So thank you all for being with us today and Joyce, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Brandy. Thanks for all the great work you're doing um, organizing these wonderful talks. We were saying earlier that um, had this been in person, many of us couldn't have gotten there because of the snow today. So, um, you know, the wonders of Zoom bringing us all together. So delighted to have so many folks here today. Um, and I wanna begin by saying it is an honor to have been a part of this collaborative curatorial team. Uh, I can't tell you how excited and grateful we are to witness field language, the painting and poetry of Warren and Jane Rohrer finally come to fruition. Field language, to my mind, represents exactly what academic art museums should strive for. Innovative, interdisciplinary projects that draw on the considerable brain power that exists across this campus, across disciplines, across cultures. I'd like to begin by thanking Erin Coe, director of the Palmer Museum of Art, who is joining us today um, and who had the considerable foresight to support and indeed embrace this project, which was brought to her attention not long after she came to Penn State. I'll have more to say about our remarkable staff, but suffice it to say, it takes many dedicated individuals to implement an exhibition of this scope. We also need to acknowledge Penn State's Office of the Executive Vice President and Provost for funding this project, both the exhibition and the catalog as part of the university's Strategic Arts and Humanities Initiative. And I'd also like to thank the lenders to the exhibition, including our institutional lenders, Locks Gallery, the Rohrer family and private collectors, many of whom are joining us today. Truly, we could not have created field language without you. Julia Kasdorf is liberal arts professor of English in the Department of English at Penn State, where she teaches courses in poetry and creative nonfiction. She has published several books of poetry, including Sleeping Preacher, Eve's Striptease, and Poetry in America. And she is also the author of a collection of essays titled The Body and the Book, Writing from a Mennonite Life, which, by the way, has a painting from the Palmer Museum of Art on its cover. 
Um, and last but not least, she's also the author of a recent publication, Shale Play, Poems and Photographs from the Fracking Fields, a collaborative documentary project with our dear colleague and friend, Stephen Rubin. Julia has long been interested in the relationships people have with the communities and places they come from, and also those places they choose to inhabit. And her writing is often concerned with social and environmental justice. Christopher Reed is Distinguished Professor of English, Visual Culture, Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Art History here at Penn State. Or as I like to think of it, he is an art historian embedded in the Department of English, where he reports out to the rest of us and where he teaches courses that focus on the relationship between literature and visual culture. He is the author of many tomes, including Bloomsbury Rooms, Not at Home, The Suppression of Domesticity in Modern Art and Architecture, Bachelor Japanists, Japanese Aesthetics and Western Masculinities, and Art and Homosexuality, A History of Ideas. Longtime supporters of the museum will recall that Chris was involved with the gorgeous Bloomsbury show, A Room of Their Own, which the Palmer hosted in 2010. I can't believe it's been a decade. He also co-curated with Professor Jonathan Abel our 2014 exhibition titled Forging Alliances, which examined the Palmer's collection of Japanese prints and ceramics to better understand the role of the arts in diplomatic relations between Japan and the United States after World War II. So I'm gonna turn the floor over to my two esteemed uh, colleagues, guest curators of this exhibition and dear friends, Chris and Julia. Thank you so much. We are so happy to be here and I wanna uh, welcome everybody to this introduction of an exhibition that will be open to you all. Yes, after a long time of working on it and several postponements due to COVID, it will be open finally in 10 days. Our exhibition will open quietly. We won't be there to welcome you. There won't be a party like we're used to at the Palmer with schmoozing and mingling. Um, so we want this preview talk to welcome you now. And maybe that's actually appropriate for this exhibition. Uh, maybe it's appropriate that you'll experience in a, it in a more contemplative mood because this is a contemplative exhibition. This photograph was taken just a little bit more than a year ago at an exhibition of Warren's work called A Silent Call at the Locks Gallery in Philadelphia. Then I noticed how good it felt to look at these paintings and be enfolded in color, in warmth, in the kind of light catching um, layering of small strokes that Warren uses to create these works in the middle of winter. And I'm thinking now, since the global pandemic and our collective witness of injustice and violence and the grief that we're all dealing with in terms of individual isolation and loss, including environmental losses like the fires and drought, I think that looking at these paintings can take us out of ourselves and return us to ourselves in relation to the wider world. They're engaging, they hold our gaze and they reward careful looking with a kind of beauty that is sustaining like the beauty of nature. So we want to assure you that even though you may be in the gallery by yourself, you will not be alone. You will be there in the company of two extraordinary people, Warren and Jane Rohr, painter and poet, respectively. Warren Rohr was born in 1927 in Smoketown, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and Jane Turner was born a year later in Broadway, Virginia, which is in the Shenandoah Valley. They both grew up on farms and Mennonite families, they met at Eastern Mennonite College, now University, and together left their traditional communities to pursue art. Jane likes to say, we ganged up and ran away. And yet they carried out their work from 1961 to 1983 on a small farm in Lancaster County in Christiana, 
Pennsylvania, where they rented their fields to Amish neighbors. Jane kept a garden and wrote poems that provide rich narrative context for Warren's abstract paintings. And this place became a gathering site for artists from the city too. Many times they were painting and writing out of the same life world and the conversations between the poems and paintings enrich our experience of each. So Warren painted in the barn, which you can see here. He created a painting studio there. Um, and here's a picture that I took when we visited uh, out the window to give you a sense of the relationship of this studio to the landscape, the views looking out over the fields and the woods. And what we've tried to do in the installation is to bring you into the Roar's world. So here you can see the um, Palmer as it looks at this moment with everybody working hard, working on the installation. Um, and, uh, and you can see this idea of a window that we've uh, created that we hope gives a bit of this feeling. Um, and in this window, um, we can display an example. You see it lying flat there. I'll show it to you um, now. Uh, uh, standing up. So this is a two-sided work um, from a series of two-sided works called Shapes, in which Warren replicated shapes that he found in the in nature around him, shapes from the pond, shapes from the reflections of the clouds in the pond, the clouds, even the gaps between uh, the branches of the trees, and painted them on both sides. Um, and he liked to hang them in the windows so that they would be uh, uh, viewable from both sides. So picking up with the um, autobiography or the, bio, the biographical notes, Warren taught for about 25 years at the Philadelphia College of Art, which is now the University of the Arts. And in 1984, the Roars moved to Mount Airy, um, which is a neighborhood of Philadelphia, where they occupied another property that had once been a barn, you can see there. Um, this is the combined house and studio of Violet Oakley, and a lot of Palmer uh, devotees will recognize Violet as the pioneering woman who painted the murals for the state capitol. And this is that in that studio, and now here it is when it was Warren's studio. So this is a story that connects to the broader art world, to the Philadelphia art world, but it's also a story that connects to Penn State. Um, because Warren Rohr, uh, when he was working as a high school teacher, um, came to take summer classes at Penn State. He says it's because this was in the 1950s. The gym teacher told him you could make more money if you had a master's degree in education. So he came up here and was taking summer school courses in art. Um, and it's where he really came to think of himself as a modern painter. The instructors, Hobson Pittman in particular, taught him to think about painting as something other than an image that depicts something, but to think about the way that textures and colors and the relationships of form are expressive in themselves. So as I said, he was here from 1952 to 1954 taking summer classes. And then he came back in 1959 as one of the instructors uh, in the Summer Art Academy here. At this point, they were living in the suburbs uh, outside of Philadelphia. And the, uh, the experience of coming back up to Penn State had a profound impact on his art. Warren Rohr said, quote, what the summer at Penn State, at State College was about, was rediscovering the farm landscape. I'd get up before sunrise to get the sun coming up across the wheat fields. So I had paintings like Sons of Buffalo Run. And there would be a couple of suns in the sky which would be located two different places in the same painting. And as much as this is a, an exhibition about place, it's also about human relationship. I got to know Warren and Jane when I was a young poet and they helped me to imagine life as somebody who came from a Mennonite background but who could also pursue a life in the arts. And in our catalog, we have um, an essay by a painter, Douglas Whitmer, telling a similar story from his perspective. And then there's the relationship, of course, I have with my collaborators, Chris and Joyce, 
who have the skills that made this exhibition possible. And then we have the title, Field Language, which is taken from a series of Warren's paintings. Field language, that relationship. In the last decade of his life, he repeatedly returned to one field in Eastern Lancaster County to photograph and sketch studies. I learned the word bustrafidon from Warren when he was discussing the field language paintings. Literally, this word means turning as the ox turns in plowing. Agriculture, which is a labor involving people and animals in the earth. The term also refers to the way that ancient people first wrote, left to right, then right to left, as the ox plows. And of course, that turn of the line is primarily what distinguishes poetry from prose. Warren Rohrer was very clear about what he saw as the connections between fieldwork, artwork, and the body. While we're showing you this picture, and what I've done is put a detail on the side uh, that, you know, just a, a kind of strip down the middle to give you a sense of all of the little details that you can see when you come to the museum and you're up close to the paintings, you, because they're, they're big paintings, they really envelop you, made out of many, many tiny little marks. And about those marks, which Warren called the stroke, he said, quote, the repeated stroke is a motor for carrying the color and going from one place to another, like walking in an immense field. It's the heartbeat, it's the breathing. And of course, the field must be bounded. Fields are defined by hedgerows or fence, fence rows or fences. Warren was as aware of fields as he was of the boundaries of human co communities, whether they're religious communities or communities of artists or campuses of academics. He understood that the edges, the margins are where the most interesting things happen. And you can see here another of Chris's details, the edge of this painting shows all this work underneath the surface. Warren said, I try to think about how the border exists. It's partly due to the confinement of an energy within a certain space. The issue is more concerned with the field and the painting now becomes the field on which I do my work. I mean, my heritage as a farm boy or growing up in the generation of farmers. The field is where you go out and do your work. It's a matter of you plow, you cultivate, you harrow, you cut, you harvest, and there is a boundary. The fence row is something that has to be reckoned with. You go to the edge and the activity is going to be an acknowledgement of what those edges are. Here are the roars together in that uh, studio that we showed you earlier. There's another great shape in the background sitting up on that uh, cupboard. Um, a second way of thinking about the ways this exhibition explores relationships is, of course, it's grounded in the Rohrer's relationships with one another and on the relationship between their paintings and their poems. As we said before, they both responded to a shared environment and they brought different perspectives. They used what Jane called a different toolbox. She said, we just had a different toolbox with which to express themselves. As I read a short poem from Jane's new book, Acquiring Land, listen for the ways the speaker refers to words as things in themselves. How driving along on a road, a phrase can call up a memory and remind her of another time and place. This poem is place. The words, dappled with sunlight, floated across the open field as I drove by. You understand the dapples did not float or the sunlight. 
just the words, since by that time I had passed and would never see that green instant again. Yet it is cut in permanence and perfect in my most real of archives, a small gallery of moving frames from another place while I am here. So these relationships that we've been talking about open on to many others. <clears throat> the Roars thought deeply about their relationship to the agri agricultural landscape and what they experienced and saw of the daily work of their neighbors all the time. Jane's poems are punctuated by allusions to the activities of the people around her, the men working in the fields, the women bringing out bread to sell. Um, and th these, but these day-to-day -day relationships are also landscape of memory. Um, one of the things that we learned, uh, there's a wonderful essay in the uh, catalog for the exhibition by the Penn State agricultural historian Sally McMurray, where she talks about the history of agriculture in Lancaster County um, in relation to uh, Warren's art. Um, and so we learned that they didn't actually grow barley in Lancaster County in 1972 when this painting was made. That the, this comes out of a memory of growing up when barley was uh, uh, crop that many of the farmers um, uh, grew in that area. Um, and so uh, here we can think of Rohr invoking the kind of complicated push-pull relationships with places that we remember, the way that those places change, but the way that we continue to draw inspiration from the way that we remember that they used to be. The exhibition also explores the relationship between art, and by that I mean both art and poetry, and craft or what we call material culture. What happens when artists transform the world around them into paintings and poems? Warren and Jane very much appreciated the meticulous labor um, that they saw in local craft traditions. And we've included a bunch of examples of, of those kinds of things, ceramics and also painted furniture in the exhibition. They collected blanket chests, for instance, um, that are, you, you can see if you look, I think you can see on this painting, if you look closely, the repeated marks there, which Warren echoed in his paintings, and you can see there above. Um, they also collected quilts. And we will include in the exhibition um, one of their very fine quilts and a quilt from Lancaster History Museum. Warren imagined that Amish women looking at the fields were inspired to create the bars pattern that you see here in this quilt, um, as he was inspired by landscape. It turns out he was mistaken. Um, but in the 1970s, he made a series of paintings that reflect that idea. And our catalog also includes an essay by quilt scholar Yannick and Smucker about the Roars collection and quilt collecting in general in that period. Oh, so there's, there's the painting that Julia was just talking about, sorry. Um, We've already mentioned the, uh, some of the essays in the catalog, which is available, uh, will be available at the Palmer, is also available to be ordered from Penn State Press. Um, and many of the other authors of the essays, and I've put the table of contents here so you can get a sense of that, will be speaking as part of the programming for the exhibition over the next few months, including Yannickin, as uh, Julia just mentioned, who will talk about quilts and quilt culture. We'll also have our colleague, the art historian uh, Nancy Locke and the artist Christopher Campbell in conversation to talk in more in detail about the techniques and effects of Rohr's color field paintings. On February 16th, uh, so just uh, barely a week into the uh, opening of the exhibition, Jonathan Walsh will be discussing another relationship, um, the relationship of Rohr's art to the art of Alma Thomas, an older African-American abstract painter who worked in Washington, DC and whose work Rohr admired. Um, details of all of those events um, are available, of course, on the Palmer website, and I think we'll show them to you again at the end of this presentation. And we also want you to know that um, two of Jane's books, brand new ones, not these, these are my copies and they, you can tell they've been worn. 
um, <laughs> two of Jane's books will be on sale in the museum shop. And finally, uh, a year from April, um, a companion exhibition to this one, which shares the same catalog, will be uh, at the Woodmere Art Museum. It focuses more closely on the relationship between the painting and the poetry. Um, we desperately hope that it will be safe by, for everyone to travel and return to normal life um, by April of uh, 2022. So that'll be another opportunity to see um, different works by Warren Rohr, um, and once again think about the uh, think about the relationships between uh, the paintings and the poems. Um, you know, as we've acknowledged, these are tough times for travel and assembly. So we've worked very hard with the help of Stephanie Thomas and the students uh, who uh, intern with her and work for her to create what we're calling a digital companion to the exhibition which has more information, videos of people talking about uh, the issues in relation to uh, the art uh, and the poetry, recordings of people reading the poetry, including not only Julia, but Jane Rohr herself and her granddaughter, who is also named Jane Rohr um, uh, and is also a poet. That will be linkable from the Palmer website when the exhibition opens. But right now, we really want to focus on the opportunity that some some of you will have, and I hope everybody will be able, who can can take it up to come and see the exhibition in person uh, here at the Palmer. And it's an opportunity that we've tried to create to look closely, to listen closely, and to make their most of their experience relating to the Roar's work. So with that, we're going to turn uh, this over um, to our colleagues uh, who have been working on the physical installation of the exhibition itself. Um, so Joyce uh, Robinson and Will Bergman, um, they will tell you a little bit about how they're working to bring this exhibition to life. Great. Um, thank you so much. That was wonderful. It's, it's always great to hear. I learn something every time I, you two <laughs> speak. And so it's just wonderful to keep um, continuing to, to grow um, in, in, this, um, in this project that we've had um, together. Uh, now, I'm, I think we might have, I'm wondering if there's some questions um, that we want to start with right away. Brandy, is, is the, am, am I, shall, we, shall I go to the questions for Julia and Chris now, or shall I keep going? Why don't you keep going for right now? And um, okay. yeah, we can. All right. But it's good to see, thank you. It's great to see the, the, um, the questions. And so I'll just remind um, other folks too, to, um, please put any questions you might have in there. Um, and I just wanna to begin too by saying, um, as you could see from the array of images that, that um, Chris and Julia showed us, we have so many uh, folks who have contributed to the exhibition um, from, as I mentioned, uh, museums, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, Woodmere Art Museum, Smith College, the Phillips Collection, uh, to many of the private lenders that we have who have tuned in today. I just want to give a shout out to um, Dolan Maxwell, uh, our good friend Ron Rumford at Dolan Maxwell, who uh, lent that beautiful, um, very, I want to say gloppy, abstract looking painting that uh, Chris showed early on, um, where he talked about when uh, Warren came to Penn State and was sort of really learning what a modern painting could be. And also just a shout out to Ron Rumford, who was a student of Warren's and who has long supported this project. So just wanna say hello to Ron um, today and, and to everyone else who has joined in. So what you're looking at here is um, a, a sketch up layout of the exhibition. This is not the final, final version. I mean, it's pretty close. There's a few things that we are tweaking. Um, you will see two paintings uh, in the sort of upper right that seem to be floating around. Those are actually two paintings from the Philadelphia Museum of Art, including Barley, um, that as it turns out are going to be coming a little bit later than anticipated because of issues that Philadelphia was dealing with, Philadelphia Museum of Art. So right now they're floating in air, um, but they will be on view elsewhere in the museum when they arrive. Um, but part of this, story for me, um, and, and what I really want to talk about with you now is that there are many narratives that exhibitions can tell. And as, as you can sense, you know, there's uh, the narratives that we have in the catalog, the online companion offers uh, other, you know, complexities and other stories. And of course, when you create an exhibition, you are creating a kind of narrative. And um, I'm sure most of you realize 
the kind of work that goes into installations, but this has been a particularly complex show made even more um, sort of interesting because of the pandemic. And um, I want to introduce uh, Will Bergman, who is our new chief preparator, not so new now, but he's, he's new to me, new to many of you. Um, Will's first day, I think, was April 1st. Is that right, Will? It was, yeah. Um, and we know what was happening in you know April 1st. So Will, who had been a preparator at the Albright Knox in Buffalo for five years, uh, came, visited the Palmer. We loved him. He loved us. We hired him. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And so Here's this uh, chief preparator who starts and can't even get in the building yet. So it's been a steep learning curve for all of us, but it's so wonderful to have tools and I'll let him talk to you a little bit about this. Tools like SketchUp that you see there uh, that can really help us um, create the kind of narrative. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, Chris, that would be great. So we did decide um, that the, the, there is a kind of chronology in the, in the um, exhibition that we want to tell. So you can see to the left, that little nook there, and there's that little painting I was talking about. Um, uh, we, those are the early works. We, we began obviously with the, that early period of Warren at Penn State. And then we want folks to move ahead and, and um, in, the, in the catalog, we refer to this as sort of patterns uh, section of the exhibition. And you can see that we um, have worked on juxtaposing the Allentown um, Amish painting there on the left. That is, of course, related to the bars quilt that you see ahead of you. I'll, I'll let uh, Will say a little more about the bars um, quilt and the installation. Um, but that's sort of why uh, when you come see the show, you'll see that we've created a kind of entry where we want you to go to the right, right? We want you to kind of enter into this early part, experiencing these paintings um, from the, the late uh, 50s on up into the 70s. Um, and then you move back around and, and continue on in the exhibition from there. But Will, do you want to go ahead and say anything about um, about quilts and sure, uh, yeah. some, some of the other issues you've been dealing with? I, I will point out that I sent these images to you on Saturday morning, and I think by Saturday afternoon they had been revised. So I, mean, <laughs> I think that is one of the benefits of this program and working remotely, especially during COVID you know, the flexibility that you need to have when you're creating an installation like this, an exhibition like this. Um, the quilts, the quilts specifically were uh, extremely collaborative. Uh, there was many versions of how we were going to install them, whether they were going to be flat on the wall or um, hung at an angle like this. Um, and that, I think it's just a good example of, of um, how you have to adapt uh, when you're installing an exhibition like this. Uh, we were actually um, informed by a conservator that this would be the best practice. So um, when you go, go into the museum, when you see the exhibition, you know, there's muslin behind it. It's there. They take up a lot of, of space, but I'll also point out that, you know, with this model and this design where you're able to see that, that, um, interpretive experience and that influence in Warren Rohr's painting on the temporary wall there and the quilt, which I think is like one of the best parts about this exhibition is the relationships you see. And, and we'll see further uh, relationships throughout the last couple slides and how Joyce and Chris and Julia were able to do that. It's, it's, it's very impressive. Yeah, and you know, we are, of course are always thinking about vistas. What, what do you see when you look across the room? What do you see if you turn around to the left and look, you know, that direction? And of course, we don't want to block any painting. So, so there really is so much that goes into to the planning of the uh, of these kinds of installations. And we want to create meaningful conversations, right? Um, particularly in this case between the quilts. Now, in the upper um, corner of this slide, you can see those two, um, the, the furniture that Will and uh, Craig Witter, another preparator at the museum, have built for the quilts. And you can see the blue wall there, um, and there's a, a sheet of white paper that's actually masking um, a poem behind it. So we have created, and it's a very important part of the exhibition, we have created um, two areas of the exhibition where we feature Jane. Right. Um, and so we have enlarged some of the poems so that you can you know, sort of stand back and, and take them in. And we are also trying something brand new. 
Uh, in part because of the pandemic, I'll be honest, um, we have um, gotten these sound domes and you can see one hanging there because we, of course, we don't want people having to touch things and press things and hold up wands to their ears at this point. So um, I think Will maybe um, discovered these and uh, helped uh, obviously install them. So Will, I don't know if you want to say anything more about it, but I'll just say that we are going to have about, hmm, I don't know, 15 to 17 poems or something. It's about 20 minutes worth of poems um, that are read by Jane and Janie and Julia. Um, and I just think it's gonna be just a wonderful thing to be able to come in, stand under this dome and, and listen to this text. So Will, do you wanna say more about the domes? So there'll be two sound domes located in the gallery uh, adjacent to two of the three vinyl poems that'll be installed. And the, the amazing thing about these sound domes is that they just create an incredibly personal and intimate experience because the audio uh, is not able to be heard if you're not standing outside of the sound dome. So you will have a little bit of a recluse away from Warren's paintings and you'll be able to stand in front of Jane's poems and listen to the audio of her daughter and granddaughter and herself and experience these. Um, so it, 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 it can be uh, a little bit of a break from, from the paintings, but also it gives so much prominence to Jane and her poems and poetry that had such an influential impact on Warren. Chris, can you go to the next slide? So this is now, if you were standing kind of back over where those earlier paintings are, this is looking the other direction. I do not know who this young woman is. That's, she's in all of these <laughs> shots, um, but she seems very nice. And um, so you can see that you're looking towards some of the later works, uh, including this wonderful um, diptych from Locke's Gallery, another of the field language paintings right straight ahead of you. That's another instance where we of course have to make sure that that freestanding wall is not blocking the edge of the painting. Also, of course, you wanna create space. These, these paintings need to breathe. Uh, folks need to be able to, to stand back from them. So, so we've done you know, the best job we can um, with you know, working within one large gallery. And of course we needed to use some of these temporary walls. You can see some of the um, painted chests. We've borrowed two of them and they are just spectacular in person. The, the surfaces are amazing. Um, and um, yeah, so these are just, again, some of the decisions that we make. Next slide, Chris. Um, I will show you too. Now you can see sort of um, the backside of, of that. Um, actually, I guess that is coming in the front wall. So, so you, we decided to create this window. I actually think this might have been a suggestion of, of director Aaron Coe. Pretty sure it was. Um, because we didn't want, we wanted visitors to go to the right but we didn't want them to feel hemmed in, right? And so uh, she came up with this idea of a sort of looking through this window and so that you could see these later works and it would entice you back over there. Um, and I should say too, you can see the little rocking horse there, the painted rocking horse um, from the Landis Valley Farm Museum. Um, that's another area back there that we have dedicated to Jane. So there'll be another sound dome um, back there. Um, but this, it was a, a very happy kind of, maybe not a coincidence, a circumstance, we had been trying to decide what to do with the shaped painting. And my, my wonderful colleague, Chris, always has big ideas. Well, let's hang it from the ceiling and let's do this and that, you know, and, and of course we try, we try our best and we still just weren't sure what we're gonna be able to do with it. So we were, I was envisioning a pedestal uh, and trying to create some way to, 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 you know, display it that way. And uh, I think collectively, the four of us were on a Zoom uh, layout call and um, it might've been Chris's idea, you know, let's, let's put the shaped panel in that window just as Warren would have, you know, been inspired to do. So um, I sort of love that that quirky um, image by, by Warren is up front, but I think in, in many ways it, it, it signals so many themes of the exhibition. Um, so, Will, I don't know if you have anything else to add here yeah. or Chris and Julia. Oh, I'll go ahead, Will. So, uh, you know, being able to simulate that window in, in the model, I think also was able to allow us to really kind of play with um, all the, you know, gestural notes on the rocking horse and the paintings that we saw and the plywood shape. 
And I, I, I think it just uh, really shows, you know, all the, how every work in the show really plays off one another. And you can see all of just the small um, specifics and details of each work reflecting off of what Warren was seeing, what Jane was seeing. And with the window, I, I think it brings it all together, yeah. And Julia and Chris, I don't know if you want to um, add anything about the uh, kind of conversations we had and, and this whole process, but. I'm uh, happy to turn to the conversations that uh, people have started in the q and okay. we want to do that. Or do you want sure. me to, do you want me to show the upcoming events? Oh, inspire. let's, yes, let's talk about the upcoming events and then we'll, we'll turn it over. And I think Brandy's going to help us with the Q and A. Um, yeah, next. As, uh, Chris, as you're shifting over to the upcoming events, I'll mention too, there was one question about whether or not this program will be recorded and yes, it will. I'll let everybody know. It usually takes about a week, but you'll find it on our, on the Palmer's YouTube channel. So it will be available there to go back to and rewatch to catch all the interesting details that were shared during this. So I'll let you know that that's, um, it, that that will be available. And then you can see the variety of programs coming up that are planned to coordinate and, you know, give a greater kind of more in-depth experience of this exhibition. Did you all want to mention anything in particular? I think I'll just, you already this... mentioned the next one coming up um, exactly. in February 16th, on February 16th at 6 p.m. It's an evening um, webinar and that is with a guest speaker who will be joining us, uh, Jonathan Frederick Waltz, will be speaking about sort of the relationship between um, Warren Rohr's work and that of um, another great painter, but not included in this exhibition, although will be on view elsewhere in the museum, Alma Thomas. Um, did you want to say anything else about that, jo uh, Joyce? That, ex the, I mean, that talk and also um, Yannick and Smucker on March 18th, I encourage everybody to, to tune in for that if you can. Um, Wednesday, March 24th, the conversation with Nancy Locke and, and Christopher Campbell, who just do such a brilliant job analyzing the paintings themselves. Um, and then Julia will be back um, on April 1st to, um, to talk more about, about Jane, uh, Jane's life and about, about poetry. So um, thank you again, Brandy, for, for working on all of these programs. I think it's um, just a, a great array and I hope we'll see everybody back for those. But let's turn to the questions now. Yes, so I'm going to start with a question that may be a little bit more pointed towards Julia, but I think others may answer as well or chime in. But David LeBlanc asks about um, the, uh, if you could perhaps provide some more context for Jane's poetry and Warren's paintings that deepen the conversation between these two art forms. Um, and he says the analogies comparing painting and poetry are long standing. Um, but do you think that Rohr's work and this exhibition highlights the tension between the art forms? And how does Warren's paintings challenge Jane's poetry? And conversely, how does Jane's toolbox challenge Warren's? Hmm. Thank you for the question, David. I know what you're asking. Um, and I did have a chance to peek at the questions before, so I've been thinking about it a little bit. Um, I think, I don't think I would say that um, they that Jane's poems challenge Warren's paintings directly or vice versa. However, I think that um, there is a way in which Warren's painting of the landscape um, can carry a kind of nostalgia and a kind of, it's a, a tone that's almost elegiac. Um, so, I mean, the most obvious example is, is the barley example, but there are others. I mean, even just thinking about somebody um, continuously returning to one particular field and painting, you know, these marks on the landscape, which are actually created by mechanical um, agricultural implements. Um, whereas I think Jane's, Jane's poems, which are, are really rooted in um, the writing of women, 
um, in the in the 70s. I mean, she was writing out of that cultural moment of truth telling and a plain spoken language. And of course, that value of plain speech is also very much there in the background they both share. Um, but I think and I, and I almost need to refer to particular poems um, where, for instance, in a poem called Auction, the speaker who appears to be a lot like the author is, is at a, an auction of family heirlooms and is um, kind of challenging the sentimental partner. I'm just going to read the last seven lines. Yet this draws you as an origin. I wonder if we dig straight down under Uncle Jason there, will we come to it? Look, I'm not buying any of this. These little final piles of things, their truth is the truth of funerals. And so you see that like direct language, the confrontation, the play with idiomatic expressions. I'm not buying any of this, right? That's a metaphor and it's literal. Um, I think that that's very uh, typical of Jane's writing and it is anything but nostalgic or sentimental. Um, and I guess I can think of other examples, but I will say in a poem like in the studio, she plays with the point of view of the writer, which who can observe everything and describe everything and then directly address the reader. And I think by implication, she's implying that she, she's describing the work of a painter in a studio who's being photographed, but she's implying that that painter's work is less portable um, and is less encompassing. So it's a, it's a more complicated conversation, um, but I think reading her work and looking at these paintings, there will be some, some rich tensions and collaborations to investigate. Thank you. Um, for any of the curators here, what do you think are the different roles that the various forms of art, poem, painting, and the craft pieces play in interpreting the theme of this exhibition? Well, I'll dive in. Uh, of course, to say that there is no single role, there's no right answer, there's no you know particular ideology that we or they are trying to put across. The point is to um, have a really rich experience and an experience that kind of slows you down so that you start to see these connections. I mean, all of us have been, who've worked on the show um, have been struck by how once you spend a lot of time looking at the paintings, when you're out in the landscape in Pennsylvania, you think, oh, that field looks just like one of those abstract paintings. It really makes you see things in a different way. And um, looking at the surfaces on the, um, whether they're on the ceramics or on the painted wood, you know, uh, they're often discussed by people as a kind of, you know, fake wood grain, but they don't actually look like somebody's trying to imitate any kind of wood. They look <laughs> like somebody is taking enormous pleasure in how you can make the same little U-shaped mark again and again and again and again. And in some ways they're all the same, but of course they're handmade, so they're slightly different. So there's a kind of um, attention to detail, to rhythm, to the experience of doing something that's repeated, but it's not repeated in a mechanical way, it's repeated in an organic way that um, kind of seeps into your experience. And, you know, and then I think you make your own connections. And that's why we really hope that people in the exhibition will kind of give themselves time to, uh, uh, to make those connections. You know, and then I find it, you know, I'm not trained to teach poetry, but then I find it when I'm reading the poems where there'll be, you know, a kind of a repeated sound or a repeated uh, sort of short 
um, like a series of phrases that where the words get less and less complicated. Um, it's kind of like a kind of refinement um, in the in the way that the language is used. That reminds me of uh, of the way I experience these uh, these visual uh, phenomena. Can I just add quickly? I, I I do think for me it it really is about this this beauty and joy and connection of mark making, and and that's what links all of these these different certainly the visual art forms that we have. And, and we've put together a second show called Mark Makers, The Language of Abstraction, that's going to feature the Alma Thomas show. Um, and I, I just think it's, it's a connection that we all need at this time to, to sort of sense another person's presence and gesture captured on, on you know, on paper, on, on canvas, on these wonderful objects. Um, and, and I will relate to you that our, our registrar, Beverly Sutley, who also deserves a huge shout out for just this immense job of getting these works packed and shipped and delivered to the Palmer. Um, she said to me, because of course she looks at every one of them, opening them and checking them said, oh my gosh, I can't believe how beautiful these are in person. I mean, they're beautiful in reproduction, but there is nothing like staying in front of them and, and seeing them, it's just, um, a remarkable experience. So I think that's what brings everything together. And Joyce, to follow up on you your last to... comment there. Oh, sorry, Chris, do you want to add on to something? Yeah, I was just going to jump in because now I found the poem that I want to read the last few lines of, um, uh, to, to, to make the point, you know, to kind of give people a way of thinking about how words are used in this way. So this is a poem called Metaphor and the last stanza goes, the other day at a party, I heard a single word fall toward me through the talk of friends, like a tree uprooted, crashing through new green growth. Was it orchard? Was it pond? Or simply hill? And I love that transition from orchard to pond to hill. It's like, you know, my grandmother used to talk about $5 words. So it's like a, it's like a, I don't know, maybe $5 word, then pond. <laughs> And then hill, the shortest, simplest, it's like really just a kind of elemental sound. And the way it, it really, if you look at the surface of those of painted chests with it's a big U shape and a little U shape and then a little dot in the middle, it's like orchard, pond, hill, again and again and again. So that's the kinds of connections that people can draw. Thank you. Um, so Joyce, I wanted to follow up um, Martin Aaron has had a question about if you have any information, can you tell when the two um, paintings might be available to the Palmer from the Philadelphia Museum of Art? Yes, I can tell you the exact date. Um, uh, Mark Makers uh, exhibition is going to open March 28th. And we are now incorporating those two gorgeous paintings, Barley and Settlement Magenta, which is breathtakingly beautiful. Um, those are going to be part of that exhibition um, now. And so they will be available um, at the end of March. Good question. And um, going back to a question from William Valerio uh, regarding the poetry and painting the relationship. And the question is, I wonder if you could comment a bit more about how Warren's practice as a painter and Jane's practice as a poet relate to contemporary social issues that are burning in America today? The search for truth and enlightenment, for example, or you know, other ideas from curators? I, I can say one thing about that. Um, and hi, Bill, thanks for being here. Um, I think what I referred to earlier as plain spoken language, um, I think it's not just about using um, direct, straightforward speech or simple words. It's also about a commitment to truth telling. And I think that's there very much in Jane's work. And it's also there in Warren's. Um, it's about looking at the world and really seeing it and speaking a truth. I think too, it's also challenging us about the assumptions we make about people who are different than us, rural people, if we view ourselves as urbanites 
or if we have a particular faith and there's another faith group and we have certain expectations about what those people do. I mean, I, I feel like I have learned so much about uh, Mennonite culture. I've, I've learned about um, State College and Penn State in the 1950s, things I didn't know. And I encourage you to, to read what, what Chris has to say on our online companion about that. Um, just again, sort of upending um, expectations and, and being open to the truths of someone else's life, right? And, and being open to receive that. So for, for me, I, I just feel like I've, I've learned a lot about Pennsylvania, about the landscape, how to pronounce Lancaster, for instance. <laughs> that. I actually knew that already. <laughs> I, I had to learn that one. <laughs> Okay, and I think a follow-up question. So I'm gonna uh, skip a little bit to Allison Janicki's question about wondering if the exhibit gives a sense of whether these two engaged in an artistic community beyond their own twosome, or if you have any insight into whether they relied most heavily on each other for artistic conversation. So it seems to kind of follow from the topic that you had previously been speaking about. I think with the um, the other craft items, et cetera, so that visual culture and the language of the visual culture, um, and also um, some of their artistic inspirations from elsewhere, or whether or not the twosome was. Well, well Julia, I wonder if you want to talk about, about Jane's sort of, okay. you know. Yeah, I mean, just it's easy to answer this question very briefly. And the answer is yes, they were very involved in the world beyond their marriage and beyond their communities of origin. I mean, from the time they were college students, they were running off to Washington DC to look at the National Gallery. Um, and Jane, um, once her children were a bit older, started auditing courses at Temple and at the University of the Arts um, where she worked with Stephen Berg. So, and Warren was very involved in the art world both in Philadelphia and a bit in New York, but also just the history of art. He kind of painted his way at one point through the history um, until he settled on, you know, the style that the abstract style that became his own later. So I think, yes, we don't wanna put too much emphasis on where people come from and lose sight of the journey that their life takes them on. A question from Carla Mulford. Um, are you suggesting that viewing these paintings and reading the poems will enable viewers or readers to notice new things within the natural environment? Typically, artists provide us glimpses of their worldview. Uh, you seem to be suggesting that the art and writing will provide the viewers or readers this new kind of insight. Do you yes, agree? I, uh, yes, I think, uh, I think that's right. Again, with the idea that, you know, we're not, we won't become them. And I know that's not what Carla was um, suggesting. Um, you know, this is, it's not about making us into, you know, have a particular kind of ideology of someone who grow, grew up in Lancaster County or, um, it's, it's rather about having us look for ourselves and particularly this idea of slowing down. Um, you know, one of the things that we do in the videos um, that are, will be on the digital companion is ask everybody involved with this, if you were going to give advice to someone who'd never seen a Warren Roar picture before, what would you, just what would you tell them to prepare? And so many people said, slow down, just give it time, let yourself look around, let yourself notice things. And I mean, that is probably a good way to be in the world. Um, so, you know, I think, I think that would really be the, the kind of impact that we hope that we hope that the show will have. Thanks. And one more question, I think we have time for it. Uh, a follow up question from David LeBlanc, uh, but more uh, geared towards Joyce and Will and your planning, say of the physical installation um, and whether or not you've made any choices within the installation to highlight or mute the conversation or tensions between the painting and poetry? Well, we certainly are trying to highlight the connections. So um, with the, the sound domes, as I mentioned, we um, 
made a selection of a, a broad range of Jane's poems. Um, and many of them certainly have re resonate with particular works. And there are some of the object labels call attention to that. There's one painting called Yellow Yellow um, that has a, a kind of reference or at least a, a resonance in one of Jane's poems. I think it's called Farm on My Mind. And we are reproducing that alongside the painting. Um, as I mentioned, we have two, two areas uh, for Jane uh, where we have reproduced, um, I think in the studio actually is one of the poems that we have uh, reproduced. We reproduce Place that, that Julia read right at the start of the exhibition before you even really see any paintings, you'll see that poem first. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're trying to, to set up those connections. Um, Will and I are still in conversation about um, Trekking the Amish Quilt is quite a long poem, it's a wonderful poem, and I think we have space for it. <laughs> so I think what we're going to try to do is, is reproduce that over by the quilts, because um, that is really going to add, I think, to, to the, the issue of, of Amish quilts that they felt that they should have known about, but, but then they saw them at the Whitney Museum in New York, and then they realized how wonderful they were. You know, So it, it's, it's kind of a complex little um, subtext in the exhibition. Will, I don't know if you want to say anything more about well, I think I think especially with the sound domes and, and the poems being throughout the exhibition, uh, it, you walk through the exhibition and and the two are just joined completely. It's Jane's poems don't leave you immediately. So as you view Warren's paintings, I mean she's still there, and you know listening to her is still there, and you can't. I mean, back to what Chris was saying, it it forces you to slow down and you engage in these paintings in a very different way and the way that the exhibition is laid out so that even after, you know, at there, there's a sound dome in the very beginning of the exhibition and there's a sound dome at the very end of the exhibition, if you look at it uh, through, a, you know, a, a visitor path, if you will. And it, it, so when you leave the exhibition, you still have Jane in your head, you know, reciting her poem. So even after you leave the exhibition, you will still be reminiscing on that and reflecting on that. And I think it's just uh, very powerful. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Well, we're really at the end of time today. And I think it was wonderful to have all of those questions from our very engaged audience. It was great to see you all here today. Again, this is being recorded and will be available. I want to remind everyone the museum is scheduled to reopen February 10th. So you can get in to visit these um, in person, take that slow, um, immersive experience to the gallery and really enjoy the painting and poetry by the Roarers. I will say that um, it's in the chat uh, a couple of times, so you might wanna grab it real quick. There's a link to help you sort of navigate getting into the museum on February 10th, because although we will remain a free admission, uh, you will need to go online to get a timed ticket in order to enter. And that system will be active as of February 8th. So please um, do know that you'll we'll want you to do that so that we can sort of manage the numbers in the galleries for COVID. So we look forward to seeing you um, in person and at the next program coming up February 16th. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.